Introducing again, Brother Carlton Mullins and his recording partner, wife and friend, Sister Pansy Mullins. Um, in this series, um, this is a series of three short messages, sermonette, um, presented by Brother Mullins. I hope you'll enjoy um, his discussion is entitled stay in focus and it's based on philippians chapter 3 verses 13 and 14. the second sermon or sermonette turning trials into triumph based on genesis chapter 45 and verse 5 and the third uh, sermon is about wellness based on philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Um, so, hope you enjoy these series of short messages, short sermons, sermonet, um, as presented by Pastor Emeritus Carlton Mullins, who spent 45 years at Ochoa's Church of Christ um, that was built in 1975, and he stepped down this year in 2020, um, but still actively involved in a Christian school in St. Anne's Bay. So enjoy the sermon. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Staying focused is the thought I would want this morning to share with all of us. Staying focused. I love the story of Elijah and Elisha as recorded in 2 Kings chapter 2. The Lord was to take Elijah. Elisha had been anointed to succeed Elijah. God told Elijah that he would be taking him out of this world and saving him the experience of death on a certain day, perhaps at a certain time and a certain place. This was passed on to Elisha, who was anointed as God had selected to take over from Elijah. Elisha had a burning desire as the day appointed had come. He wanted to receive what he called a double portion of Elijah's spirit. That was his request. That was his goal. Elijah had told him that his request would be granted if, if he saw when he was taken up. In other words, what you want, you will get. But the condition is, see me when I'm going up. And since Elisha wanted that particular gift, he decided that he would not take his eyes off Elijah. Several distractions came his way that day. I call them tests of his focus, tests of his desire. Elijah wanted him to stay and wait while he went on a mission. Not at all, not at all, says Elisha. Wherever you are going, I will be going with you. Three times there was a test to lose focus, but each time Elisha knew what he wanted and would not be deterred. Then there were the sons of the prophets who sought to distract him, but he did not lose focus. Finally, there was a great heavenly display of chariots of fire and horses of fire that would demand the attention of any man, but not Elisha. He badly wanted a double portion of Elijah's power and nothing, nothing is going to dim his focus. And my beloved, he got it. He got it. And what a wonderful prophet Elisha turned out to be. So it was, he turned out to be God's powerful prophet. And his message to us is, stay positively focused. Stay focused. 
Do not let yourself be distracted. George Headley was one of the greatest cricketers of the West Indies. He was Jamaican, of course. George Headley put fear in every bowler, be it spin bowler, be it pace bowler, be it medium pace bowler. In an interview that he made with C.L.R. James, it is recorded, he was asked, what caused you to be so prolific a run scorer and a batsman? George Headley's response was, I keep focus on the bowler. If I don't see the ball leaving the bowler's hand, I'm in trouble. His attention, therefore, was not on the spectators, nor on the scoreboard, nor on anything else. His focus was on the bowler and the ball leaving the bowler's arm. And he would say the same to us today. Stay focused. Stay focused. You know, my beloved, Peter learned the bitter end of losing focus when he took his eyes off Jesus. And what happened? He began to sink. The Apostle Paul also asked us to stay focused, forgetting the things of the past. He said, I press, and he urges us also so to do, toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That I may know him was his goal and the object of his focus, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and become conformed to his death. And St. Paul would say to us this morning, as he said in times past, look unto Jesus, stay focused. That was a victory of the heroes of faith. They stayed focused, positively focused, and they were triumphant in the end as we journey life's pathway there are distractions that may dim our focus and cause us to lose focus we must try not to fall victims to these distractions there are many many distractions there's distraction like fear fear takes our eyes off the positive the positivity of faith then there is doubt Doubt that causes us sometimes to question our very faith. Doubt that causes us to question the power of God. Doubt that causes us to forget the past and God's action and power and the victory and the blessings of the past. And begin to doubt. And when, when we are in doubt, we begin to ask questions. And, and when we ask questions, they get us confused. And when we get confused, we are up to lose focus. And then there is the distraction of anxiety and worry. Oh, how we allow anxiety to get control of us. And like our dear friend, passing brother, Brother Taylor used to say, worry is like an old rocking chair. It rocks you here and it rocks you there, but it gets you nowhere. And such is anxiety. And that is why Jesus said, be anxious for nothing. And Paul reminds us that in everything with, by prayer and supplication, let our needs be made known unto God. Don't allow anxiety and worry to distract and to take away from the positivity of our focus. And also there is a distraction of the seeming success of the people of the world. The psalmist was led to this in Psalm 66. When he said, look here, when I see the seeming prosperity of the wicked and look at my own, as it were, poverty, he said, have I labored in vain? But no, when he went into the house of the Lord, he found out what a wonderful blessing he really had. And so the seeming success of the world must never be allowed to dim our focus. And then, of course, there is our lack of commitment and purposefulness. Many of us Christians, we don't really know what we want from the Lord. We don't know where we are going. We don't have any objectivity. Unlike Elisha, there is not that purposefulness. This is what I want from the Lord. And this is what I will focus on. So my beloved... 
Stay focused, like Elisha. Focused like Paul, like the heroes of the faith. For we will be more than conquerors. Jesus is there with his outstretched arm, ready to satisfy, ready to reward, ready to bless, ready to allow us and aid us to stay focused. So stay focused. Wait on the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Be obedient to his word and seek his fullness. And remember that they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Don't I ever love this? Oh Lord, what a beautiful, encouraging passage of scripture. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength, climb up with wings like eagles, run and not be weary, walk and not faint. So, wait upon the Lord, stay focused, and remember that those who set their eyes on Jesus will never be disappointed, will never fall, will never sink, will never lose. For in Christ, there is victory. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your manservant, Elisha, who stayed focused to the very end, that he received what you had in store for him. Thank you, Lord. Help us to focus on Jesus as always. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 45 and verse 5. This is the words that Joseph used to his brothers. Be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that he sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Genesis 45 and verse 5. I say without fear of contradiction, for I say so from experience that the greatest joy in life is to be a Christian. That is why the hymn writer could echo with conviction and joy, I have Christ, what want I more? And yet, amidst the joy of a living hope, we will have to go through trials and temptations, sometimes through tribulations. But did not the Apostle Paul remind us that they that will live godly in this life will suffer persecution? And again, St. James uh, made it clear that the man who endures trials are blessed, for he will receive the crown of life. James 1 and verse 12. But we have the assurance that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. And again, in spite of trials and tests, Christians are not victims. We are victors. Christians are not losers. We are winners. We are not poor things. We are princes and, and princesses, for we are children of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Therefore, when we are admonished to work out our, our salvation with fear and trembling, it is also an admonition to turn our trials into triumphs. And our trials can be turned into triumph. Just think of how monotonous life would be if there were no hills to climb and no rivers to cross. Trials are the test, my beloved, that tells us of what substance we really are. And so I want to use the lives of three men from scriptures who turned their trials into triumph and what they teach us. Jacob comes to mind and the story part of Jacob that I would like to use comes from Genesis 29 and 30, chapters 29 and 30. Jacob loved Rachel with a passion. He bargained with her father and his uncle Laban to work seven years to get her as his wife and he worked seven years and the scripture says 
when the seven, the seven years he loved Rachel with such a, a passion that the seven years just flew off as if it was weeks. But when the time came, Laban gave him, not Rachel, the woman he loved passionately, but Leah, the oldest sister, or the older sister. Jacob considered himself trapped, betrayed, and deceived. He had to work another seven years to get the woman of his dreams and the woman of his love and passion. But Jacob used his trials to amass a fortune. By the end of the second seven years, he had as much cattle as his uncle. He became a rich man in adversity and in spite of the trials. So jo Jacob, instead of cursing the darkness, he lit a candle. You know, someone said, if life hands you a lemon, make lemonade. Jacob turned his trials into triumph. And if he did so triumphantly, so can we. Then we go to Joseph, sold into slavery by his jealous and covetous brothers, and falsely charged for attempted rape, and imprisoned and abandoned, he rose to be prime minister of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. Oh, Joseph had every reason to hate, to be vengeful, to question God, but no, he was determined to turn his trials into triumph. And so with the spirit of a Christ-like character, he held no grudge. He did not curse the past, but he saw his experiences as God preparing him for the betterment of humanity, even his brothers. They meant him ill, but he saw the good hand of God in their actions. So he said to them, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me in uh, thither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Oh, what a beautiful way to look upon our adversities and our trials and the circumstances that come our way. God has a hand in it. God has sent me beforehand, he said, to prepare the way to preserve life for even you. Then we go to St. Paul. Paul had come to, gone to Rome with confidence that the justice he had been denied by his own people would be meted out to him when he saw Caesar. But alas, after his great and moving welcome into the city of Rome, three years later, he found himself a prisoner under house arrest, still waiting to see Caesar. But what did he do? I tell you what he did. He turned his trials into triumphs. He preached the gospel. His house became a church. And maybe his, his bedroom became a classroom. He preached the gospel. He taught the scriptures. And he converted Caesar's guards and many others. And then he wrote letters. We call them epistles. My, my friends, my beloved, had it not been for his imprisonment, we would not have had what is called the prison epistles of Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, Timothy, and Philemon. How poorer would be our faith and knowledge without these epistles? So, beloved, Amidst their, their trials and difficulties, all three had some great lessons for us in our trying circumstances and in our trying times. First of all, they had a firm belief that what God allows is for our greater good. Amen. Let me repeat that. What God allows is for the greater good. That's why the psalmist says in Psalm 46, God is my refuge and my strength and a present help in the time of trouble. Therefore, 
when trials and difficulties and adversity come, they trust God all the more. They trust in the God Almighty, the great deliverer. Secondly, they teach us that trials bring opportunities. Let me repeat that because it is so true. Trials bring opportunities. Behind every dark cloud is a silver lining. So what is there for us? What's the message for us? The message is grasp the opportunities for the greater good. Thirdly, we learn that trials bring out the qualities of faith and trust while preparing us for the crown of glory. They all had and they all knew that the Christian's victory is secured and the testings are to make us shine brighter and rejoice all the more. So let me remind us that whether the trials be on the inside or on the outside, victory through faith in God and Christ is there for us. We must learn to turn our trials into triumph because God is there to lead us through them. God is there to prepare the way for us. God is there to allow us in his own time to see the bigger picture as Joseph did. And so let's learn to turn our, our trials into triumph like Jacob, like Joseph, like Paul, and like many others. Put your faith and your trust in Jesus and then turn your trials into triumph. May God give us a victory today, this week, and always, as we trust in his redemptive grace. Amen. Lord, trials may come, hardships may come, adversities may come our way, but you are the mighty deliverer. We put our trust and our confidence in you, Father, to lead us safely through. Give us, Father, that determined zeal to turn our trials into triumphs. I greet you well in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Blessed be God who has given unto us life and health and immortality. Praise be to him. I read one verse, Philippians 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. We bless you, O Lord, for yet another day, for life, for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. And now, Lord, this is your day, and we are your people. Richly blessed, we pray you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Much is being said these days about wellness. We are being admonished to eat well, exercise much, take our vitamins, have regular checkups, and exercise. And we are told what foods and drinks we should avoid. We are to understand truly that God intends that we have healthy bodies, that we enjoy good health, and that we live long lives. We are warned and admonished in scriptures to take care of our bodies. We are admonished about the sin of gluttony and overeating. Every person over 35 should have regular checkup. Men over 45 should have annual prostate tests and examinations. And ladies should have their regular mammograms, pap smears, and other internal examinations. Everyone over 50 should have regular tests for hypertension and diabetes, glaucoma, uh, cataract, colon, and of course heart. The doctor will also give tests for reflexes and mobility, etc. And what I'm saying, beloved, is to preserve good physical health, we have to take care and we have to take 
preventative measures. We are responsible for our health. So that's a physical health, important to our well-being. But there is also mental health. Mental health is not to be minimized. The Bible tells us that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We must therefore be careful of our thinking process. If what we eat and how we exercise keep the physical body healthy and well, then it is also true that what we think affects our minds and our minds affect our physical state and our action. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The mind, beloved, controls the body. And we are told that mental fitness is affected by tension, depression, anxiety, worries, lack of rest. If the mind is not functioning right, the entire body will be affected. As a matter of fact, mental health is key to physical health. That's why we have to be very careful of the things on which we feed our minds. The things we read, the television programs we watch, the conversations we have. For you know, gossip is a terrible thing on the mental process. And the hatred, the animosity and unforgiving spirit that we cultivate. We've got to be very careful of these for they affect the mind and the mind affects the body. When the mental process is not functioning correctly, the man loses control of himself, lacks civility, becomes self-centered, self aggressive and difficult to get along with. Good mental health keep us in control and enables us to function properly. We must exercise our mental faculties. The Apostle Paul in our text from Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 gives us six exercises that will keep us mentally healthy. He says that we are to think, think on the things that are true, the things that are honest, the things that are just, the things that are pure, the things that are lovely, and the things which are of good report. And notice that these are positive things. Positive things, you know, build up, edifies, and give us joy and the impetus to triumph over our circumstances. Negativism is a danger to the mind and to the body. The negative mind is most cantankerous, uncooperative, contrary, and miserable. And God knows we are what we feed our minds on. Feed our minds on the positive things and on the good things. And in return, we will have healthy bodies as well. But beloved, as important as it is to have a healthy body and a healthy mind, more important is to be spiritually healthy. That is, to have a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Mankind has three dimensions at what we are talking about this morning. There is a physical man, the mental man, and the spiritual man. All three are important for good health. From time to time, we has to pay at, we have to pay attention to our wellness physically and mentally. But we must also pay attention to the spiritual. Jesus said, it is better to go through life maimed and have an entrance into eternity with God than to go through life well and healthy, but to be cast out of God's presence. And I'm not here speaking about being religious or of going to church or of reading the Bible and of praying. I am speaking of having a personal encounter with Jesus. I am speaking of being saved, of being converted, of being committed to Jesus Christ and to his cause. The soul of man is most precious to God. That is why Jesus came into this world and went to the cross. There is no happiness, there is no fulfillment, there is no real life 
until and unless that life is wrapped up and tied up and tangled up with Jesus. Blessed is that man who seeks first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, for then all things will be added unto him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So three most important things in life is our physical well-being, our mental well-being, but most important, our spiritual well-being. Are you spiritually healthy this morning? May God help us so to be. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the reminder, Lord, to keep ourselves healthy, to keep ourselves tied up and tangled up in Jesus. Lord, help us to concentrate our lives on Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.